Welcome back. In this next section, I'm going to walk you through the IPO process and the secondary markets for securities. So I'll start off talking about the IPO process. I'll talk about the concept of underpricing and why it's important. And then we'll talk about the secondary markets and how stock exchanges typically work. I'll end this video though talking about the important financial le legislation that you should absolutely know about and I'll also talk about what innovations we've seen in the last 20 years. Now, as I mentioned in the last video, there's many reasons why a firm's management and shareholders would want to undertake an IPO. So let's talk about how that process happens. Initially, the board is going to sign off on an IPO. Uh, sometimes the CEO will actually reach out to the board and recommend that they undertake an IPO. Sometimes it'll actually be the board itself that reaches that conclusion. Now, when the board takes the vote and decides that they want to undertake an IPO, the first thing they're going to do is hire an investment bank or iBank. The investment banker is going to sell the new shares of the firm's stock to the investment banker's clients. In many cases, the IPO is going to be large enough that the investment banker will need other banks to join in when issuing shares to their clients. When a group of investment banks undertakes an IPO, this is referred to as the syndicate but there's always going to be at least one lead investment bank. The investment bank or syndicate's job is to put together the prospectus, which is the document that details every piece of value relevant information about the firm that's selling its shares to the public. The prospectus is often known as the S1 statement or the red herring sometimes. S1 statement is just the SEC's term for it. So let's take a look at an example S1 statement. Here we have SNAP's S1 statement that was filed with the SEC. So if I scroll down here, you'll see the calculation of the registration fee, which uh, we have some information for. Uh, down here though, this is what we're after. Let me zoom in so you can actually see it. So SNAP is offering to sell blank number of shares of their class A common stock in this offering. Uh, they might sell an additional blank number of shares. And if I scroll out here, we might see the price to the public, which is blank. So this is what we typically see in an S1 statement. Uh, essentially, we don't know the price of these IPO shares, and we don't number, know the number of shares that are outstanding. Uh, quite frankly, this is why we undertake the next step of the IPO process called the roadshow. Oh, and by the way, here are the investment banks that were associated with SNAP's IPO. Okay, now the roadshow is the firm's chance to meet with clients of the investment bank or syndicate from around the world. Their goal is to create interest in those investors so the firm and a representative of the investment bank will travel around all around the world and they'll meet with those clients. They'll answer questions from the iBank's clients, and if everything goes well, the clients will give the firm and the investment bank some indication of how much they'd be willing to pay for shares and how many shares they'd want. This is why the roadshow is often referred to as book building. Now, the firm and the iBanking syndicate are gauging interest, and after the roadshow, they'll determine the number of shares that they can sell and at what price. If they decide to undertake the IPO, then they'll set the price and sell a certain number of shares to the syndicate's clients. If they decide there isn't enough interest and they can't raise an appropriate amount of cash for the, from the sale of the stock, they'll actually cancel the IPO. Now the next step is to set the price in the S1 statement, which when completed is called the registration statement. And once the firm puts the price and the number of shares they're going to sell in that statement, they send it to the SEC. If the SEC doesn't ask for any revisions to the registration statement, then the firm will sell its shares to the syndicate's clients for the same price. Uh, part of the cash raised will be used to pay the investment bank's fee, and this fee is often referred to as flotation costs, and is historically around 7% of the cash raised. Now let's take a look at a completed registration statement. Okay, so here is the registration statement from when Goldman Sachs undertook its IPO in 1999. So we have some information. The firm is offering about 55 million shares, and uh, we have some additional information on those shares. We know the IPO price, so these shares are being sold at $53 per share. We know the 
information about the amount or the total value raised for the company. And we also know the firms undertaking the IPO as part of the syndicate. Uh, so Goldman is actually the lead underwriter for its own IPO. And these were the other f investment banks that were associated with that IPO. Now, once the shares are distributed, they'll start to trade on the exchange the firm has contracted with to allow the shareholders to buy and sell shares. For example, Snap's shares trade on the NASDAQ, while Goldman Sachs shares uh, from its 1999 IPO were listed on the New York Stock Exchange. The final step in this process is the lockup period expiration. The lockup period refers to the period when shareholders who held shares prior to the IPO are not allowed to sell their shares, and you can probably see why. If these early investors were allowed to liquidate their positions on the first day of trading, then the trades that they make could lead to significant uh, selling pressure and decrease the share price and cause prospective investors in the secondary market to hesitate from buying. Now, there's a lot of other parts to IPOs that I haven't covered, but I mean, quite frankly, we could spend an entire month on the subject and still just scratch the surface. There are IPOs that involve shelf registration, where the firm doesn't sell all of the new shares, but instead keeps some shares and sells them to new investors at some point in uh, the next two years. There's other, I mean, there's a variety of ways that IPO shares are sold to the public. Let's talk a little more about the investment banks. Now, the primary role of an investment bank is to underwrite and sell securities for uh, firms to the clients of the investment bank. Now, investment banks can create almost any type of security, including bonds, stocks, and preferred stock. So typically, here's a breakdown of how this entire transaction works. You know, the firm will come to a lead investment banker, they'll put together the full syndicate, and then ultimately the shares or securities being sold are going to be sold to this group's clients. Now, since the 1980s, the standard compensation for this syndicate has been around 7% of the cash raised. And when an investment bank oversees an IPO, there's typically two ways that they can sell it. Uh, we have first the best efforts method, and this involves the investment bank giving its best efforts to sell the shares to its clients. Any shares that can't be sold are not issued. The other common method is called the firm commitment method. And the firm commitment method is more risky for the investment bank. It involves the members of the syndicate buying the shares that are not purchased by their clients and then holding those shares in their own portfolio. Now, as you can imagine, this firm commitment method is significantly more risky for the investment bank. And therefore, whenever we see that the firm commitment method is being used for an IPO, it's a much stronger signal of the quality of the IPO firm. Now let's take a look at Meta's IPO. As you're aware, Meta is a publicly traded firm, and it became publicly traded in 2012. So here's how it happened. In early 2012, Meta was working with its syndicate, which included JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and Goldman Sachs. The syndicate put out the S1 statement on February 1st of 2012, and then Mark Zuckerberg and the members of the syndicate began the roadshow. Now, when they took Meta on the roadshow, what they found was that there was enormous demand to buy shares of Meta's stock. Uh, so essentially, we have this term out there, we say that it was highly oversubscribed, meaning that the clients of the syndicate absolutely wanted to buy more shares than Meta was considering offering. So Meta decided to actually issue additional shares, so they increased the size of the IPO. Their initial expected IPO price before the roadshow was between $28 and $35. And after the roadshow, Mark Zuckerberg announced that there would be a 25% increase in the number of shares being issued, and they would set the share price to $38 a share. Uh, now, when they decided that, they drew up the final prospectus, i.e. the registration statement, and the IPO occurred on May 18th, 2012. At the time, this was the largest U.S. tech IPO uh, in history, and it was underpriced at a very small margin. In other words, uh, the one day, the first day's return was about 0.6%, and then about several months later, the lockup period expired. So... 
pre-IPO investors could sell their shares on August 16th of 2012. Now, the return on the first day of trading is very important for IPOs. Management doesn't want the price of shares to fall. And the good news is that historically, that one-day return has been about 15% on average across all time periods, industries, and countries. In other words, shares that start out worth $100 at 9.30 a.m. when the market's open will be worth, on average, $115 by the end of trading that day. Now, this large one-day return phenomenon is referred to as IPO underpricing because these shares are clearly priced below the price the market would be willing to pay for them. However, the amount of underpricing is not consistent across IPOs. So let me show you this. I took this data from Jay Ritter, who's arguably the world's leading academic authority on IPOs. Uh, as you can see, the stock of tech firms during the dot-com bubble was heavily underpriced. Notice that the mean underpricing of IPOs in mature for, of mature firms during the 1980s was only 3.8%. So we have this huge difference in underpricing. So what's going on here? Why is underpricing so high for some IPOs and so low for other IPOs? Well, there are several reasons that researchers have noted why IPO underpricing exists. The reason that I believe is most likely is that IPO stocks are risky. If a manager is going to incentivize clients of an investment bank to buy shares of a stock that's young and probably hasn't turned a profit, they're likely going to have to underprice the shares to the point that those investment banking clients will buy the shares. Therefore, the riskier the security, the greater the underpricing. So if I go back to this slide right here, what you can see is that internet and tech stocks are very highly underpriced. Uh, biotech stocks, same thing. These are typically very risky stocks, and that's, I think, why so many of them are so heavily underpriced. There are, however, other explanations, two of which I want to mention here. First, there are several researchers who have hypothesized that the firm is compensating investors for specifying their level of interest on the roadshow. The argument here is that the firm's management is incentivizing institutional investors that buy these shares to give up their private information. The compensation would need to be higher for riskier securities. And then the last possible explanation that a lot of academics have thrown out is that underpricing the issuance leaves a good taste in investors' mouths. The argument here is that the firm might need to issue an SEO, or sec secondary equity offering, which occurs when the firm issues more shares of stock to raise more cash. If the firm left a good taste in investors' mouths during the IPO, aka investors earned a large return, then they should be more likely to buy shares of the SEO. There's less empirical evidence to support this theory, though. The firm might never issue an SEO, or it might issue new shares very far in the future. Uh, so as you can tell, I think the first theory here, the, the risk story, is the most likely explanation for IPO underpricing. Now, once a firm issues shares, those shares will begin to trade on an exchange. And there's two types of investors that are most likely to buy or sell those shares. First, we have individual or retail investors. So that would include you and I. And the way those investors will typically buy and sell shares is they'll open a brokerage account with a broker dealer like TD Ameritrade or, oh, there's several of them out there. Scott Trade and E-Trade are quite old and have been acquired, but you also have Fidelity, you have Robinhood, uh, a large number of them out there. Uh, at the same time, broker dealers operate in this space. As their name implies, a broker dealer serves dual roles. First, they fill the role of a broker by taking orders from individual clients like you and me, so they'll help us buy and sell our securities, they'll, and they'll match those orders with the, the broker's open orders. The other role that they have is to act as a dealer or market maker. In this role, they buy and sell securities on their own behalf in an attempt to make a profit. Most of the brokers you've ever heard of, like TD Ameritrade, are both brokers and dealers. And to simplify their title, I'm just going to call these broker dealers brokers throughout the rest of the course but just know that pretty much all brokers also have a deal making side of their business now let's talk about the exchanges where stocks 
typically trade in the secondary market. Now, as a disclaimer, what I'm about to discuss is a topic called market microstructure, which refers to the structure of the markets and how securities trade in those markets. One of the things you should know about market microstructure is that it can change rapidly. In fact, since the first time I taught an investments class in 2016 at Indiana State, uh, the terminology has changed a lot. Keep in mind that if you're a junior right now, the microstructure of the exchanges could potentially change by the time you graduate. All right, so let's get started. The first market we have is the New York Stock Exchange, or the NYSE for short. It's one of the oldest stock exchanges in the U.S. and historically has had a trading floor. Now, to be listed on the NYSE, a firm has to maintain a share price of at least 2 to $3 and have a market cap of at least $40 million. If you want to see the specific listing requirements, go ahead and click this uh, hyperlink and you'll see them. Uh, now, historically, the NYSE is where the most prestigious firms list their shares. So a lot of the blue chip firms that are not tech firms actually have their shares trading there. So Berkshire Hathaway, Coca-Cola, Ford, all of these companies have their shares listed on the NYSE. Now, if you've ever seen a picture like this, well, you've probably seen the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. A designated market maker sits at each of these different stations and their role, the role of the DMM, is to create liquidity for one stock. They handle large orders and they keep track of the order book. If an institutional investor wants to buy a million shares of Ford, they're probably going to buy it on the floor of the, US, of the stock exchange. The other way that shares trade on the NYSE is electronically. In addition to floor trades, the NYSE employs an online system called Super Display Book. Now, this is a server-based system where brokers can trade shares on their own or on their client's behalf without having to be on the floor of the exchange. So let's take a look at how the NYSE works today. So I just showed you the designated market makers on the floor. Uh, that's the physical location. Typically, trades made there are for very, very large orders. And so you can have brokers reaching out there. Uh, the floor of the NYSE, nowadays, it handles about 10% of all trading activity. Uh, so brokers might connect with the DMM, and those brokers will probably have some retail clients like you and me. Uh, at the same time, Super Display Book exists, and this is where a lot of the online orders are processed. So this handles about 90% of the exchange activity. So brokers like Fidelity or Robinhood will connect to Super Display Book, uh, and those brokers will have clients. Again, they could be like you and me. And uh, so that's that. I mean, basically, there's a link here. So uh, you know, anytime orders are updated in Super Display Book, the DMM can see that. And so generally, there's there should be parity here between the, the bot, the, uh, trading prices. Now, uh, brokers themselves can also process orders. If I want to buy shares, let's say I want to buy 100 shares worth of Ford, and I send that order to my broker, my broker might want to sell 100 shares of Ford. And so they may actually take the opposing side of that trade. So some orders might not even make it to the actual super display book. Now, the next exchange that we need to discuss is the NASDAQ which was created in 1975. Because it's newer, it's unsurprisingly more modern. The NASDAQ lists about 3,000 different stocks right now, and just like the NYSE, firms choose to list their shares on the NASDAQ. A firm will choose between the NYSE or the NASDAQ or some other exchange. And the reason they'll choose one or the other is because the firm has to pay an annual fee uh, to the exchange for its shares to trade there. And there's a lot of different characteristics of each exchange. So typically you pick one in a certain country and then you stick with it. Now the NASDAQ primarily hosts the stock of tech firms and smaller firms. Firms like Google and Apple both list their shares on the NASDAQ, even though they're now large, uh, but they, they are tech firms. Uh, the big difference between NYSE and NASDAQ is that there's no trading floor for the NASDAQ. All trades occur all online electronically. So let's take a look at how the NASDAQ works today. So you have the central server in Mawa, New Jersey. That location will be important later. Uh, and then you have brokers that connect to the NASDAQ, and the, those brokers will have a bunch of retail clients, potentially. So 
If I'm retail investor one right here, and I want to buy 100 shares of Ford, I send that order to my broker. If my broker isn't going to fill that themselves, they send that order to the NASDAQ server. And then this broker might have a client who's willing to uh, take the opposite side of that trade. So uh, basically, the NASDAQ just connects traders from, oh, everywhere on earth. Now, there are other exchanges besides the NASDAQ and the NYSE, both inside and outside the U.S. Inside the U.S., there are regional exchanges like the Boston Stock Exchange, Miami Stock Exchange, and Philadelphia Stock Exchange. In recent years, many of these exchanges have been acquired by the NASDAQ and the NYSE Euronext. Uh, for example, the Philadelphia Stock Exchange is now known as NASDAQ OMX PHLX. Uh, NYSE Euronext is the firm that owns the New York Stock Exchange, and it was founded when NYSE acquired the European Stock Exchange Euronext in 2007. So what I'm trying to get at here is that there have been a large number of mergers over the last, oh, 20 years or so. Essentially, the industry for exchanges is consolidating, and you have a couple large players here. You have NYSE Euronext, you have NASDAQ, you've got a couple large international players as well, and that's that. Now, we have a couple of other exchanges out there that allow the trading of other securities. So for options, we have options exchanges. So the big one here, you could say, is the SIBO or Chicago Board Options Exchange. If you want to trade stock options, this is one place that you could do it. We also have exchanges that allow the trading of futures contracts. Uh, a lot of these are actually going to be based in Chicago because Chicago has historically been a, a hub for commodities. Uh, the big exchange here is going to be the CME group. Uh, there's been massive consolidation in this uh, area for the last couple of years, and so the, uh, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and a couple of other exchanges consolidated, and now you have this big company, the CME group, which kind of dominates this space. Now let's talk about alternative trading systems, uh, or as they're sometimes known, electronic communications networks or ECNs. ECNs are trading venues that function like exchanges, but don't exercise regulatory authority over their subscribers. Essentially, they're a way for many investors to submit orders from a trading platform without having to be at a physical exchange. Almost any broker that offers a trading platform is giving their clients access to their alternative trading system. So if you've ever taken a look at TD Ameritrade's Thinkorswim platform, that would be an example of an alternative trading system or an ECN. Now, if you're on that network, you have the ability to buy and sell different securities in real time, and we'll see several examples of these in class. So typically when I buy shares of uh, different stocks or ETFs, I'm doing it on my broker's ECN. So I, a lot of the time I'll use Fidelity as my broker. Now these platforms, they allow retail investors like you and me to buy and sell securities. Uh, the investors will mostly submit limit orders where they specify the most they're willing to pay or the least they're willing to sell at. We'll talk about limit orders later in this class. And whether you get to buy shares depends on the limit price that you submit and on the speed with which the order travels to the server. ECNs are used primarily for trading stocks and currency. Now let's switch gears and talk about something that's a little less interesting, uh, legislation and regulation. Now, uh, the reason I want you to know something about this is because it is absolutely crucial to know where we started and why we're here at this point in time. And uh, to do that, you need to know something about the big pieces of legislation in the U.S. over the last hundred years. You might know that the SEC, or Securities and Exchange Commission, is the organization in the U.S. that oversees the securities markets. Uh, now, the SEC sets regulations and examines cases of insider trading and fraud. However, this wasn't always the case. Prior to the 1930s, there was almost no regulation governing the information that needed to be reported publicly, and there was widespread fraud. In the 1920s, securities regulations were decided at the state level, not the federal level. Now, one problem with this is that some states had more lax regulations than other states, and firms found that they could sell shares easily across state lines. As you know, there was a market crash starting in 1929, which kicked off the Great Depression, and as a result of some of the issues that 
uh, were, that came about, there was this organization called the PCORA Commission that found widespread evidence of conflicts of interest, inaccurate information about securities, and just outright fraud running up to the 1929 crisis. Uh, as a result, Congress passed the Securities Act of 1933, which required the full disclosure of information by companies to investors. All securities were also required to be registered with the FTC. Congress also passed the Glass-Steagall Act, which broke up banking operations. This act prevented brokers, commercial banks, and investment banks from engaging in each other's operations. This meant that investment banks and investment companies could no longer take deposits from customers. It also created the FDIC, and it created federal deposit insurance. This act is why if your bank fails, your deposits are protected. The following year... Congress passed the Securities Exchange Act, which created the SEC and invested it with the power to regulate the buying and selling of securities. The act also allows the SEC to investigate securities fraud and insider trading, which occurs when a corporate insider profits from their knowledge of private firm information. This act also gives the SEC the power to oversee brokerage firms transfer agents, and clearing agencies, as well as self-regulatory organizations like the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange. Now, from the 1930s to the 1990s, the U.S. financial industry was relatively fragmented, and the banking industry was heavily regulated. It was, it was regulated at the state level as well. And that held for a long time, all the way through the late 1980s. However, in the 1990s, we started to see some consolidation and deregulation. Uh, so, we have other acts that got passed like Regal Neal, but the big act that you should know about is the Financial Services Modernization Act, which passed in 1999. And the big part of this act was that it allowed brokers, investment banks, and commercial banks, which had been forced to be separated, to start to merge with one another. And so uh, what ended up happening was that this act, also known as uh, the Graham leach bliley Act, you started to see a huge amount of merger activity. So these rapid mergers allowed a significant increase in bank size and interconnectivity after the Financial Services Modernization Act passed. And this is ultimately, I would say, one of the biggest contributors to the 2008 financial crisis. Many investment banks like Goldman Sachs reclassified as commercial banks, while others like Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns purchased large amounts of risky securities like mortgage-backed securities. Uh, when it became apparent that these mortgage-backed securities were highly overvalued, the banks that purchased them began to take write-downs on their balance sheets, and the write-downs decreased the value of these large banks that owned them, and it led to low book value of equity and high debt-to-equity ratios. Uh, Bear Stearns was able to be acquired by J.P. Morgan Chase, but in 2008, when Lehman Brothers tried to get out from under this massive amount of debt that it had, it was allowed to fail. Uh, now, this is often seen as the start of the 2008 financial crisis, the moment when Lehman Brothers declared bankruptcy in September of 2008. But the issues that caused Lehman and Bear to fail, these were present for years in most of the large investment banks. And I, I would make a case that deregulation allowed these banks to engage in riskier activities and become big enough that well, in the case of, oh, several banks, they, they were too big to fail. They had to be bailed out. Now, the final act that you should know about was the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010. And this was developed to correct many of the problems that were made evident by the 2008 financial crisis. This bill saw the creation of the CFPB, or Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, which is tasked with protecting consumers in the financial sector, and in the past, the CFPB has set maximum interest rates on credit cards, and it addresses grievances from consumers. This act also created the Financial Stability Oversight Council, also known as the FSOC for short, and it also created the Office of Financial Research. Now, the FSOC is tasked with identifying risks to the financial stability of the United States. The council consists of 10 voting members and 5 non-voting members. And... The chair is typically the Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, a lot of the big financial regulatory agencies like the OCC, the CFPB, uh, they all have seats on this board. Now, the reason 
the FSOC exists is to identify threats to the U.S. financial system that might affect one area of the financial industry, but could be addressed by many areas of the financial industry. In other words, this is the big organization that is tasked with pre preventing another financial crisis. Now, they're supported by the OFR, the Office of Financial Research, which is basically a research organization that provides data and analysis to the FSOC. All right, so that's enough about legislation. I think I'll wrap up this video by talking about some of the more interesting innovations that have taken place in the financial markets in the last several years. Uh, the first we have are dark pools. And dark pools are trading networks for broker dealers that are not connected to the main exchange. All right, so let's take a look at how a dark pool actually works. So I've gone back to my NASDAQ example and I've put in here a dark pool. As you can see, there's three brokers or investors that are connected to this dark pool. Uh, there's several reasons why they might want this dark pool to be created. The biggest one is that this dark pool preserves the anonymity of the buyers and sellers of securities in the dark pool, uh, which is a big advantage for institutions that want to make large orders. Uh, so basically, you can join this dark pool and then you're trades will occur off the main exchange. So essentially these are private trades being handled on the dark pool. So let's take a look at an example why someone would do this. Let's say that Carl Icahn, who is a hedge fund manager and well-known corporate raider, uh, has identified an undervalued firm and he wants his hedge fund to buy the majority stake of the firm's shares. If he uses the NASDAQ server to purchase shares from retail investors in large quantities, smart investors are immediately going to recognize that he's buying up a large number of shares and will probably try to acquire a majority stake in the not too distant future. If they can buy those shares before Carl Icahn, in other words, front run him, he'll likely have to buy shares from them at a premium. The dark pool allows Icahn to buy a large percentage of the shares outstanding with some degree of silence. The next innovation I wanted to discuss is algorithmic trading. And algorithmic trading is an automated way of trading. Algorithmic trading is used for several reasons. Uh, an algorithm can process new information and trade on that information in a fraction of a second, which is beneficial if a firm needs to be the first to use some new information. Algorithmic trading can also be used to trade based on complicated formulas that are created by quants or quantitative analysts. Essentially, algorithmic trading just involves an algorithm being written to make trades. Uh, the benefit here is that once you write the algorithm, your profit will depend upon the quality of that algorithm. However, if there's an error in the code or the trading strategy you believe will allow you to beat the market doesn't work, you could find yourself losing a large amount of money. Now, the final innovation I want to mention here is high frequency trading or HFT. Now, high frequency traders are algorithmic traders whose goal is to be the first to trade on some new piece of information. They accomplish this by using very fast computers and maintaining servers that are close to the server running an exchange. So let's take a look at an example. So I mentioned earlier that the NASDAQ server is in Mawa, New Jersey. Many high frequency traders locate their servers as close as they can to that server so that their orders have a shorter latency time, aka travel time. In this example, Broker 1's server is in Chicago, while Broker 2's server is in New York. Both brokers create and run a same algorithm to analyze the text of the Federal Reserve's beige book at 2 p.m. on the day that it's posted. Now, when the beige book is posted, the information it contains indicates that U.S. economic conditions are worse than expected. Uh, in this example, both brokers will submit orders to sell shares before other investors do so. However, Broker 2's orders will arrive at the NASDAQ server before Broker 1's order, because Broker 2 is closer geographically. If both their orders are otherwise the same, then Broker 2 will get to sell their shares before Broker 1 can. While there might not be a large return based on Bayes' report information, uh, in 2017, it was estimated that high frequency traders initiate about 10 to 20% of the trading volume of equities in the, uh, on the NASDAQ. So these high frequency traders, they represent a huge percentage of the trades outstanding today. Okay. So let's recap. We talked about IPOs and IPOs are historically underpriced on average. 
We also talked about how most of the volume of shares traded in the US is done via stock exchanges like the NYSE and NASDAQ, and most of the volume on those exchanges is electronic. For the NYSE, that's about 90%. For the NASDAQ, that's 100%. And although there's many exchanges around the world, pretty much every exchange right now is a, a uh, an electronic exchange as opposed to a solely physical exchange. Uh, I've walked through regulations in the past, oh, 100 years, and what you should have gotten a sense of is prior to the 1920s, there was mass deregulation. Then we saw regulation, and then in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, we saw deregulation leading up to the financial crisis, and now we're slightly more regulated than we were. So with that said, I'm going to end here, and I will see you on the next video. Thank you.